Okay, good. So um, I'm, uh, I'm very grateful also to, uh, for, for the opportunity to speak here, partly because um, obviously it's a topic I'm, I have been interested in and it's an honor to get to address a, a group uh, like this. And then it just so happens that though I am finishing up a book on uh, madness, which does actually, does actually, I mean, not the not 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 the same madness exactly that we're that we're dealing with here, but uh, but still, uh, it, I mean, it has some relationships. But I actually um, have been have uh, been desperately not trying and not really finishing this book. But it's pretty close to the end. And actually, I was all I was becoming interested in education as a um, as a uh, as a focus of extremely interesting and you know morally morally important uses of numbers. And then somehow somebody, you know, I've, I've found friends and I get the chance to come to these events. So uh, after I have, you know, finished boring myself with what I present to you, then I get to hear what you have to say about this subject. And I'm, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm kind of doing my research as, as it were, as I try to uh, get, uh, get some uh, fragment of the understanding of this topic that you, many of you already have or are developing. So uh, that's quite good. Um, I use the title um, representing and intervening, I guess I can advance. That's Ian Hacking in the lower uh, right hand corner. Um, since um, Florian mentioned that I've had some episodes in Germany, I had a quite formative episode in Germany just out of graduate school in between my two postdoctoral years in the um, Lesser, the less famous German city that begins with B, namely Bielefeld, uh, where this uh, actually fantastic institution, the Center for Interdisciplinary Research, Centrum für Interdisziplinäre Forschung, had a project for the year on um, um, the probabilistic revolution. And though it's, they were, th it was uh, uh, formed in a philosophical spirit, uh, that is to say, with a focus on ideas and the, you know, the, 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 the move to the point that physics could give up determinism. There were some of us, and Ian Hacking was certainly among them, who actually was trained as a philosopher, but who was looking, he was, had become very interested in Michel Foucault and was looking at the, uh, at the very humble, you know, bureaucratic, or, or not exactly humble, or so seemingly humble bureaucratic, uses of numbers uh, um, for, I mean, in, uh, you know, in, uh, the, uh, in, the, in the Prussian state and other such situations. <coughs> so, <coughs> uh, and, and actually, it, uh, it just so happens that though I didn't know he was, he had written his book, The um, <coughs> Emergence of Probability in 1975. And in 1975, I was an undergraduate at Stanford University and I took a, his, a class from him uh, and um, though I don't think he ever mentioned this book, and I didn't know about it. <laughs> but I'm, I, you know, on the, uh, the the topic of the darker forces or something that are beneath the surface, I always wonder what what did I learn in this class that might explain, uh, you know, why I ended up doing the sorts of things I have been doing. But uh, uh, but uh, at um, Bielefeld, so he was there for the year also, and he uh, though he did write, he was working on what the book that became. Um, the Taming of Chance. Uh, he had just finished the book that I have up there, Representing and Intervening, which is this brilliant, you know, one of the pioneering works that was, uh, that was finally taking history and philosophy of experimentation and laboratories seriously, rather than thinking that philosophy was, 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 it, it was just about concepts. And, uh, and that word, so representing, <coughs> obviously, <coughs> excuse me, stands for the ideas of science and intervening stands for uh, the laboratory life and the, inter and the interaction with objects. Well, I don't know if he was saying it, putting it exactly that way. Um, and the point is actually in some way that um, experimentation is not only about using material, you know, techniques and technologies to find out about the true laws or, uh, you know, of uh, the world experimentation has a life of its own, so people were beginning to say that, and his point actually in some way that experimentation makes many of the objects and the phenomena that, it, that, that uh, science often characterizes as 
discovering, that is to say, new things come into the world. He was talking about lasers in that, at that time. He said, it may well be true, I think it's true, um, that uh, you, know, you look out in the universe and you find no lasers, but laser is a capacity, nature has the capacity to, or I should say humans have the capacity to get uh, light, uh, get to, to get uh, you know, wave, waves to laze, to become lasers, and so it is uh, not just that science discovers, but that science makes. I think that's a better level of sound. Thank you. Um, good. Um, um, so, um, so anyhow, now the relationship between uh, between uh, experimental science, between theory and experiment, is not just that you know plodding people conduct experiments to test. Theories which are, which are developed by brilliant people, which is kind of how Karl Popper has it, but that experiment is doing, it's, it interacts with theory, but it has its own kind of life. Okay, so, I, so that representing and intervening, and the intervening has now become, I think, a lot more interesting than it usually was, at least for philosophers. People actually doing it knew how, knew how interesting they were in it, at least though. Right, oops, there we are. So, um, <clears throat> in intervening is about uh, making things and not only about uh, discovering them. Um, but we're interested in topics like education. Of course, that includes science education, but how does this kind of analysis apply to the social sciences or the human sciences? Um, um, and, uh, um, I've come around late in life to using this, using this phrase, human sciences, when I realized that it was not just another word for social science, but is a different set of phenomena. The, I mean, actually, once you begin thinking of it that way, the human science, almost every science is a human science, but uh, certainly medicine, maybe an inhuman human science some of the time, but nevertheless, it's, a, it's, it's a, caught up in the dynamic not just of you know, being humans, but of addressing the problems, explicitly the problems of humans and trying to, um, you know, um, to put them to use in some uh, fashion. So, and the human sciences, I would say, whereas let's say social science, you know, they say, um, the, if you think of a bird, at least I, say, I don't know, you, you, think of a, you probably think of something like a robin, you know, about this big and, you know, and if you think of a human science, if you think of a, a, a social science, you think of sociology. If you think of human science, you either probably have anthropology, which is literally that, or, um, or, 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 or psychology, psychiatry, or some mix of those things. So it changes the focus a little bit. And it also takes in, I would say, I don't know what you, so we have a lot of education researchers here. We could take a poll whether you think that you're doing you know, social science or not. But surely, surely education research is human science, at least. So I would say the professional um, um, you know, the, the uh, professional science or the studies, you know, the, the, um, the work that, that the uh, um, uh, perhaps scholarly, perhaps scientific uh, work that professions do is absolutely included in that. So I list a few things that I think are clearly human science that uh, maybe aren't so clearly social science, including, um, well, psychiatry, even psychology is a, a secedes sometimes from the def definition of as Social science, preferring behavioral um, professions like law and medicine, architecture and planning, management studies, and certainly education. So, um, but so we have uh, you know a category of of, uh, of endeavors, sometimes academic and often out in the world, uh, which um, uh, which uh, you know is. Uh, um, you know, in, in engage somehow in solving uh, problems with various kinds of theoretical resources. Um, uh, does it make sense to talk about this as engaged in intervening, in creating phenomena, in, in hacking sense? Um, well, I mean, uh, Radhika, uh, or, or, or one of, maybe it was Camilla, one of you said, 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 commented on the, I think it was Radhika, yes, the, 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 using this uh, representing an intervening formulation rather than the very familiar term of performativity. And uh, there are a couple of reasons why I have done that. But the most important of these is that um, um, performativity kind of, if you know, kind of supposes that you define uh, the act of, um, of uh, making the um, scientific finding, I'll say, actually helps to cause the phenomena to form. 
That is to say, it tends to, and a classic example is some, some uh, pr methods for pricing securities, and the guys calculate you know, what it should be, and then gradually the security markets converge on that price, although actually, and then they, and then when they break from it, they break from it catastrophically, actually, so it's not even, so, so, so but, um, but, uh, but I would say that I like, I like intervening and the Ian Hacking's formulation because it leaves open the possibility also of, um, of the action the, of the relationship between the perform between the scientific work and the uh, and what happens out in the world as diverging from or exploiting or undermining rather than reinforcing the thing that pretends to or that, that claims to have been that, that people claim to have discovered. Um, but we should I think it's worth asking then what are the what what power does do things have what power do the do the um, human sciences have to Produce that intervention, and what are the what, what kind of a dynamic does it put does it put in place, and uh, you know, and what do we want? What do we think about this kind of this kind of work, and how can it be used, and uh, and uh, what dangers does it present us with? So the human sciences typically they're dealing with things you know outdoors. That is elaborate. There are laboratories, but that was a laboratory with a somewhat different meaning from the laboratories that physicists use. Uh, and they, um, one kind of natural science ideal, which would be to control every variable but one, is really out of, out of reach for the human sciences. It actually already is out of reach for most of biology, at least, you know, rising above the, uh, the molecular uh, level. So, um, and yet I think that, and this was actually one of the things that, that, that um, I, I, I was most excited about in thinking through you know, trust in numbers is that uh, they are engaged, they're absolutely engaged in remaking the world. I mean, the social sciences have been a little nervous about claiming that kind of thing because they've wanted to stand sort of above the interventions to be providing knowledge which then somebody else can apply. But I think if we look at the real life and activity of the social sciences, and even more so if we extend, and if we, if we use this other uh, cutting, that is to say, uh, using the human sciences, we find they're engaged with that all the time, that the uh, world doesn't sit still while, the, while people study until they finally intervene, but rather the, um, uh, the world is being shaped by that, by that research activity some of the time as the, as the research activity is being shaped by that, and the, um, whether successfully or not, as it were, experiments are happening, policy experiments are happening out in the world all the time. Uh, it, it, it also, you know, you know, don't need me to tell you that they, they may not, uh, that is the, um, the experts uh, nominally in charge of the thing may not have as much control as they would like over the phenomena. So they can also distance themselves from that if, if it doesn't come out the way they hoped, but they are absolutely engaged and often in very, very important ways with interventions which produce phenomena that weren't there before. Uh, they have uh, immense power, even if that power is harder to discipline and control from the power that, uh, that goes into physics. So, um, and I think again that actually, um, what happens in the laboratory, I mean certainly some uh, social sciences, human sciences have laboratories, and what happens in the laboratory um, doesn't yet look like an intervention that remakes society most of the time. But meanwhile, um, those, uh, same, those, uh, uh, those ideas, those approaches, those technologies are also put to use in places like classrooms or um, you know, engineering planning or a thousand other things where they really are reshaping and not just gaining new knowledge of the things they describe. They set the, the research as part of a dynamic. It sets things in motion. Those that those, those, those new phenomena act back on the science. Um, we can't say that, uh, you know, the, uh, we can't say that, um, that uh, you know, psychology or anthropology are simply less capable of intervening, less capable of, uh, of, uh, of acting in the world. They act as well and they produce things that matter and they produce things perhaps more uh, often than the physicists do which react back in a negative or in, in a, 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 you know, a correcting way, I don't know, the correcting isn't the word I want, they react back on, the, on, on the, what they were doing and they perhaps undermine the knowledge rather than 
reaffirming it. And that, I think, is a very, it's not the only way it can happen. They can all, certainly things can, the human sciences can, can create things that endure, but uh, the really interesting ones are the ones that, um, that, uh, that spin out of control, and that's what I'm interested in, mostly here. Okay, well, I, um, in the course of, uh, of uh, you know, taking, uh, thinking about this, I, uh, got, I got interested in, uh, you know, in that contrast. I want to say a little bit more about, about the relationship between you know, natural or physical, really physical and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, human sciences. And there's this, uh, Eugene Wigner is a, one of, the, one of uh, the four very famous Hungarian physicists who became quite important in the United States in the time of the Second World War and afterwards, and were involved in things like building the bomb, an experiment, an episode of scientific power that we can't easily forget. And he wrote an essay in 1960 called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the, actually he says in the natural sciences. So I thought, well, that's interesting. I wonder, is, is this something, he's thinking actually that this is distinguishing natural science from social science, and we might not come to the same Conclusion, and he asks a philosophical question, which hasn't totally lost its persuasiveness. Uh, you know, how is it possible for, for, uh, for mathematics, which he describes as a pure, a pure product of the mind, to, uh, um, to describe the natural world at all? How can we think of something which, uh, which, which, which uh, shapes the world? And then he says, you know, it not all, I mean, actually, in, in the, quite deep, rich ways and going beyond the thing perhaps we started with. Um, well, I'm so, yeah, yeah, I, so actually, I, this is an essay I had known of forever. And I finally, a couple of years ago, last year, I went and read it. He says some, uh, some interesting things. I'm gonna just read this first quotation. We are in a position similar to that of a man. I, I, I just say, he's thinking about, you know, we started with the law of falling bodies. There, so I put I have Pisa uh, there, the uh, Leaning Tower, where Galileo actually did not, I think a history has clearly shown that Galileo did not drop two, two bodies from, you know, a big, a big and a small uh, one, one to test uh, um, uh, Aristotle's theory of motion, but uh, still the icon is there. Um, um, so I mean, we start with, start with the law of falling bodies, and pretty soon you're also talking about what holds the moon in its orbit around the Earth and so on, so it goes beyond uh, the, the problem you started with, and that's part of that. So that's actually what he was thinking of when he says, we're in a position similar to the, that of a man who is provided with a bunch of keys and who having to open several doors in succession, always hit on the right key on the first or second trial. He became skeptical concerning the uniqueness of the coordination between the keys and doors. He means that these are, you know, these, these keys have, are, re, are really true, as it were, keys, and that's why they open all the doors as opposed to the false keys, which presumably would produce failure in science. But we can think of uh, what uh, Avigner has done in another way, and that is we do something about with these keys, you know, actually the same guy who made the keys made the locks. Um, so that's why, you know, that's why the keys, uh, or some, that some, and then uh, in thinking, uh, thinking now of, of the, of the uh, human sciences, we have um, uh, perhaps other alternatives in as, that, than Platonism to explain the ability to solve all kinds of problems with a small set of mathematical tools that maybe actually uh, we have ways also of, of producing matches or of exploiting the tools to gain knowledge about things which they don't intrinsically automatically match. Um, well, I was um, uh, actually uh, thinking about, um, about uh, official statistics. I'm gonna say a few more words about official statistics, uh, but, uh, but we can just, before we say official statistics, we can say Newton's laws, and actually after, and actually, uh, and uh, Ian Hacking's, um, well, um, colleague for some time, spouse, Nancy Cartwright uh, points out all the, all the work of manipulation of uh, which uh, ha is necessary, for, for example, all the statistics which is necessary to get that kind of a match between the, as it were, pure theory. Uh, the, um, the arrangement of the data, the approximation techniques. She wrote a book called How, how the Laws of Physics Lie. 
that lie, as you'll get, is a pun, meaning both you know, what they are and also how they deceive us. And the deception is in the supposition that the keys automatically fit the doors as opposed to all the locksmiths who are you know, fixing, fixing the doors so that the keys can open them. So uh, it only, it only a few keys, you know, the, uh, whatever, a few, a few basic mathematical techniques. So the other way of seeing this is, uh, is a kind of manipula uh, not, manipulation is an unfriendly word, the kind of, um, of adjustments and approximations and so on that are necessary in order to, in order to make these things work. And um, um, well, actually, so then I, I thought, um, you know, what does, uh, what, this, he says natural sciences, I don't know what statistics is, a mathematical science in some ways, originally, as its name suggests, a state science, and, um, and actually as a state, you know, statistic, as a, a Stat, whether it's statistic or a Staatswissenschaft in German, uh, as a, a state science, um, 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 how does it uh, work for, um, I mean, it, it, I'm sorry, as a state science, it's a social science. Um, uh, but actually it has this mathematical side as well. And um, uh, there's actually, you know, so um, um, uh, one of the most impressive seeming um, um, examples actually of this kind of, this kind of, uh, of, of knowledge was uh, one of the, was the normal curve, the bell-shaped curve certainly known to educationists, uh, um, uh, which uh, was found, you know, a, uh, you know, a key which has unlocked doors everywhere. Um, and, well, actually, Wigner doesn't exactly say that, except he does give this example without really thinking he's departing from it. He says, um, well, he tells the story of a humanist uh, talking to a mathematical scientist and um, the mathematical scientist is writing some equations, as, which is what mathematical scientists should do in a story like this. And the humanist looks at what's that? And he says, well, he says, um, that's, uh, that's, a, um, um, that, that's about, uh, about, um, about, uh, about, uh, you know, about humans. And he, the humanist wants to know, uh, you know about human population growth and what, the, what and, and, yeah, and, and he says, um, What's that there? Well, that's just pi. That's the, you know, the, in, in, the for, for, in the formula for a circle. And the humanist uh, finger says, very reasonably, you know, scoffs and says, um, you know, this is some kind of a joke. What does the radius of a circle, what, uh, what does pi, the radius of a circle, have to do with, um, uh, with, with human populations? Surely a population has nothing to do with the circumference of the circle, he says. But in fact, this, uh, you know, the, the pi in the normal curve is everywhere. Um, uh, and, um, you know, Figder actually recognizes the humanist had a point in thinking so, even though he's somehow totally wrong at the same time. So, but, uh, but that formula is one of those, say I say, is one of those keys which has opened uh, so many doors. It's not that easy, again, to separate off the human and the natural sciences from the standpoint of the use of these tools, and uh, they both is partly in because both have tools for making things in the world, as well as describing what happens, as it were, independently of them. Uh, well, I just mentioned Adolphe Quetelet, the 19th century Belgian, and I could, I, could, I could and have mentioned a lot of other people who were fascinated by the universal reach of the normal curve. So the bell, sh the bell shaped curve, and that um, is uh, part of uh, um, this impressive story, which Figner, in the end, kind of, kind of allows into the story without ever saying human science or social science. Um, so, you know, Figner spoke of the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the natural sciences, and it is unreasonably effective in human in human sciences as well. In uh, not uh, not entirely different way. Oh, I, sorry, I mean, actually, uh, Florian um, nicely pointed out my, uh, or, you know, um, uh, you know um, um, my, my, I don't know, um, recognition, which I partly owe to my advisor, Charles Gillespie, about the, the flow of, uh, of uh, things across disciplinary boundaries in both directions. And I do want to, uh, to, to emphasize that point as well. Okay. and. Um, um, 
So, uh, so one, um, um, again, still focusing on this question, uh, in what ways can human sciences make things, that is, as opposed to finding out about them, uh, and, um, and for that I wanted to think a little about official statistics, which is also, again, actually along with, as it were, this, this um, probabilistic mathematics, um, uh, one of the, as, you know, one of the two or perhaps three um, uh, forms of knowledge which were so crucial for forming this kind of understanding, statistical understanding. So how, what about, how does uh, official statistics relate to that? Um, there's uh, somehow the, the scholarship, I th the scholarship on, on official statistics is flourishing along with uh, lots of other aspects of the, of the, of the uses of numbers. Um, and um, um, uh, a standard view, which would be certainly Foucault's, and it was actually one, one that Ian Hacking was very impressed with, at least uh, in, uh, in um, his early scholarship, is that it's a kind of, it is a projection of power onto the people ruled, uh, so that the official statistics becomes, if not tyrannical, actually it's more subtle than tyranny. Perhaps, you know, tyranny fails, but this one, this one imposes a grid that people accept and apply. And um, that would be, again, that kind of Foucaultian idea, which I think is a very important one, would be part of the power of the human sciences to make things by, through their definitions, through their classifications, to make people to make people behave in new ways, to make societies uh, um, act on people in new ways, or, or, or uh, I mean, actually, in some, that, not, I, don't, I don't want to say societies act on, but the process force works from within to reshape human activity. Um, um, and, but um, a new body of scholarship uh, is, and including, well, I mean, emphasizing actually, it is also the case that these things are used to hold states in check. Uh, to, you know, the objective measure to show um, that uh, states, the claims of, of uh, state leaders are not being fulfilled or that the states are failing at what they should be doing. And actually quite a lot of, uh, of, uh, of, of, um, of uh, official statistics or let's say of state statistics is associated with this project of, shall we say, resistance as well as with the project of projecting power. Uh, and uh, lots of people say things like, Rousseau is, uh, I think, one of the earlier, though not the only, says the government. So how do we decide whether a state is working well or not? Very simple. The government under which the citizens most increase and multiply is infallibly the best. So population would be our answer. Um, here's a, 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 you know, a, more than a, a 130 years later, another French man called Alfred de Fauville says, rest assured that whenever the struggle resurfaces between the champions of the general interest and those of private interest, you will find statisticians at our post arms and ready to match, march, that is judging the, the quality of leadership of the states who cannot, you know, they can pretend, but when we bring quantitative science to bear, we can find out whether it's really true that they are succeeding as they tell us they are doing. Uh, well, I, um, there's a little uh, outbreak of books on gross, gross domestic product, GDP, I recently reviewed a couple, and there's a third at least um, in the last two years. And actually before that, a, um, a whole study that the French uh, Prime Minister, uh, then Sarkozy, com commissioned with uh, famous economists and a whole team of people who actually cast doubt on GDP, on this measure, as a proper index of anything that we should want to use to decide, you know, whether, you know, actually, you know, whether, I mean, as it were, the modern Rousseau would say, look at GDP and we can tell, and now there's a movement questioning uh, its, uh, uh, it, its appropriateness, and I won't, I could, you may well know some of the arguments against, I won't spend time on that now, but there's a good argument that it's the wrong thing, and it certainly is, uh, as, as used, is, is a terrible index if you're worried about environmental changes, especially because they discount away everything, so that by 200, the world could be destroyed in 200 years and it wouldn't affect the it would be a rounding error in the GDP measure projection now. So, um, um, anyhow, it again is one of those things which is in this great tradition of using numbers to get outside of political discourse and to, and to assess the quality of leadership, the quality of governments uh, in the world, and to judge them, to take away their power to you know to 
con to, con to, uh, to disguise their failures with uh, great claims of success that uh, we, can get, we can get underneath and see what's really happening. The GDP didn't grow, or it only grew at 2%, and the last government was at least doing 2.5%. So I think there's actually, we have to think of, we think of, uh, you know, of uh, the mathematician, this humanist looks at the mathematician and he's doing this work. He's turned topics of everyday debate into technical topics, which seem to, uh, uh, to in get in the way of democratic politics. But there is another sense in which all this work actually, that if, if all this fancy work, which most of us don't understand, produces in the end one measure, and we can say now, you know, the un or, you know, we can say now GDP is only increasing at 1.8% instead of the 2.3 that we have a right to expect. We have a thing which in some sense we can, we don't exactly all understand, but we, if we accept that, we can all manipulate it. So there is a kind of, as it were, democratic power or democratic discourse made possible around these um, seemingly easy and technical products. The technical product is domesticated for uh, for ordinary use by people who don't know anything about, which is most of us too, right? That is, you know what you do, but you probably don't know how to do GDP. And I know a few things about that, but I certainly couldn't make such a measure. So um, that somehow the technical product also becomes a product of, of, of everyday analysis, if not exactly of everyday understanding. Um, so they make the world more difficult to understand, and they make it easy in some way. But what do we, what do we say then about this, about the easy forms? We might, be, uh, we might be scornful, and that would actually be for people, let's say, let's say people like us, that is, where that's not exactly what we do, or maybe that's the, you might take that attitude also towards educational measures. I don't know that these are simple things which somehow we find it necessary to use because the complex understanding that we have built up built up can't really be communicated to people. So we try to have simple things which get close enough to where, we're, where we hope to get, and then, you know, we don't exactly get, if they really put, just put us in charge, then we can do better, but they don't do that, so we use simple measures and we try to, we hope that that will, you know, coax people off in the right direction. So there is a whole history, actually, of treating, you know, treating um, numbers as simplifications for an ignorant public. That isn't, you don't have to reject the numbers entirely to do that. You might say they give us a start and then we can think about their virtues and dis disadvantages and whether they apply to this, this case or that case. And then we might go on to say, well, but the people who just say they look at uh, a GDP, they look at a literacy rate, they look at the mean, uh, the mean quality of mathematics instruction in, uh, in uh, Finland and they go, or Taiwan and they compare it with the United States or Germany and they, you know, conclude whatever that they are, you know, well, maybe, you know, um, maybe that's just, uh, you know, that's the kind of, of falseness that we offer people uh, because they're never going to understand the complex realities and we hope it's, we hope it's close. Um, and I, anyhow, so, uh, and I've, the kinds of things I read, I see that, that kind of critique that the numbers are for the simple people uh, quite a lot. Here's one guy you never heard of writing in 1904, actually his line. He repeated it in several editions. I'll just read that out loud. To make a comparison com so complex as this demands sustained attention and a mind accustomed to the re relativity of things. Um, the relativity of things, right? Anyhow, so for purposes of influencing the general public, an argument loses force in proportion as it takes more terms and comprehends a wider field. Statistical problems are not questions of elementary arithmetic for the common crowd. So just enter that on your consciousness. Statistical problems are not questions of elementary arithmetic for the common crowd. Uh, uh, Florian, uh, you know, uh, mentioned my uh, arguments about um, about statistics in the public domain, and that's so. This is a this is actually a person who is obviously not that enthused about statistics, and yet is willing to see it used for uh, you know to satisfy people. And then, but actually, in a more that is, he assumes he has more confidence in their ability 
we just give the people these numbers and then we'll go about and, and, and behave very expertly and, and reach wise conclusions. But we maybe will use those numbers, but we'll think around them and we'll use them and then we'll, we'll consider the limitations and the defects of the numbers and then we can do well. So he's kind of confident um, that experts can do the right things and, and they can feed the general public numbers, which will keep it from complaining. Um, but there are some problems. So I entered this one, one, one little more, a little, uh, you know, backup and diversion is the great career of the indicator. Um, the indicator uh, before, I mean, there, it, was, uh, it was pointing originally and its etymology uh, suggests that, uh, um, but the word indicator um, seems to have taken off actually in the form of uh, the indicator bird, which really is a bird in Africa. Uh, and uh, this uh, literary person describing it, if you can read, you can, you, perhaps you can read that as I'm talking, who says it sounds like, you know, it sounds like a cloud cuckoo land, this story. The indicator bird flies around and makes loud noises and gets people to come over and open up the honey's nest because it doesn't, isn't powerful enough to, to get into the honey's nest itself. It sounds like a little story from some kind of natural theology. Uh, but there really are these indicator birds and actually lots of skeptical people went through this and discovered the, uh, the amazing career of the indicator. Uh, they thought it was a cuckoo because, they, because it lays, laid its eggs in other nests as well. So this tricky indicator uh, bird, uh, but it is actually a quite different bird with a similar behavior. But this behavior of, uh, of getting honey by luring actually probably first of all badgers and then people to go open up the open up the, uh, the, uh, the, the hive so that the, the, so that the bird could get the honey. That, is, uh, uh, that was well established by, by 1839 when Lee Hunt has his, actually, and then he writes a literary journal and he calls it the indicator on the theory that this is, he's going to have all this miscellany in it and you can trust his, that is, rather than you have to go search everywhere for interesting stuff, he if he put it in, the, in his book, it's a good enough indicator for you to read it. That's what he would like it to be, right? So, but, uh, so indication, indi indi indicators, but pretty soon then uh, indicators become, we think of them perhaps as neoliberal, though they are not just, actually there's neoliberal is everywhere and, uh, and in all times, I think um, indicators are, um, are things we use to guide us. Uh, uh, and they actually have the characteristic um, of being, uh, being uh, that is an indicator is something, it is not the thing itself, it is, and it has a relationship. Yeah, I don't actually see the honey yet. What I see is the bird, this bird flying around and making noises, which I have taken to understand as an indication of there being honey uh, in the, uh, that I can follow the bird and get to the honey. There's a gap between the indication and the reality, though the bird might be very, very reliable, but may perhaps other things aren't entirely reliable. Is the indication of, uh, of uh, health in, as a function of uh, some relationship of height to weight, is that a good measure of health or not, or does it indicate reliably? That's just, sorry, that, that, that just, uh, you know, if you, uh, in the indicators that came right up in a web search. Here's a real classic in, uh, case of the American president, Herbert, Herbert Hoover, looking for non-state ways of regulating the economy, promoted a budding movement to have indicators of, uh, of economic cycles. That is what drops first so that the businessmen can um, anticipate uh, when, the, when the economy is going to fall and, uh, and they can actually take it, make adjustments to soften, to smooth the, the, uh, the rise and fall of, of a cyclical economy. The economic cycle can be conquered through the use of these indicators and um, it was a super optimistic project in the 1920s. Herbert Hoover, the great leader of it all was elected president in 1920 or 28 and became president in 1929. And it didn't look as if, you know, hereafter things should be good in economic management. Um, so anyhow, the economic, there, there are uh, episode, times when the, in the indic indicators, these uh, random indicators fell apart totally in the new conditions of the depression. So one has to be careful of the gap between the indicator and the reality it is supposed to 
give us, and I'll just say again, I'm not going to tell you, I mean, those, actually, uh, Mary Morgan uh, uh, led me, as it were, she was my indicator leading me to this uh, little bit of material, and, um, and uh, those, all those graphs of things, they look like they add up uh, a dozen different things which are just totally heterogeneous and have no, seem to have no logical relationship to other except that they all seem to head down and to head up at about the same time, so the average of them should be a good indication of of changes in economic activity. Um, um, so, um, I think that this, this use of, uh, of automatic uh, uh, materials for standardizing and judging, uh, which um, actually when I wrote Trust in Numbers, I thought was kind of an American thing, which didn't know quite what Europe would do with it. And I think in some respects in education is one of them. Europe has bit this, bit, bit, bit this ideal with as much enthusiasm as ever happened in the United States and in the domain of education. Well, I'm not sure about, certainly in, in, in higher, in university life, uh, more so actually than, than the US. Now, so the, uh, this uh, you know, enthusiasm for numerical reasoning and numerical policy making in, uh, in relation to many important topics has become quite important worldwide and certainly within, the, within Europe. And I think that European Union or non-union, whatever, semi-partial European Union has probably has a lot to do with that, but I'm not going to lecture you on that. For, uh, we, maybe, 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 we'll, maybe we'll discuss it. Um, uh, this idea of, uh, of having uniform rules to, uh, uh, you know, to break down principles of nationality. And I would say numbers uh, perhaps have a function a little bit like if I may be forgiven for saying so, the English language as a universal, as a, as a, as a thing which is supposed to be shared by everyone. Uh, uh, maybe we don't know if God spoke in English, but people increasingly think he did, so, or she. Um, um, okay, so these, um, 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 these are a set of incentives that we can call a neoliberal, um, um, in which the, I mean, the use of, uh, of uh, measures like indicators, like uh, GDP, also are um, intended to, um, oh, to, to provide a basis for, um, for uh, decentralized activity to, to produce goals, to harness people's, rather than through uh, um, systematic uh, planning uh, at, by a state, to provide incentives for people to achieve the goals that we want. And, uh, uh, and uh, I think that educational measures are that kind of a thing, and, and there are a thousand other things uh, like that. So remember, we, before I got to the indicator, I was talking about the, oh, sorry, about the, about the, um, about the suspicions that, some, that uh, elites often had of the simple numbers which people could use. And this guy, Lies, who thinks that we can give people numbers uh, and uh, they will be satisfied with that. And meanwhile, we can make the necessary you know, uh, amendments and qualifications and so on privately and keep the system working well. And, uh, but in the, um, the, the uh, democratic situation of, uh, uh, of uh, current times and actually in a uh, world where we rely on, um, on uh, contractors or so or whatever institutions to fulfill, to be rewarded for fulfilling certain goals, uh, then actually the space between the indicator and the thing we're really looking for may not be so stable. And so this is, uh, I think, the, as it were, the indicator function is my uh, favorite example of the problems that this kind of, that this kind of quantitative rule can create. And when, uh, when the, uh, there we uh, have an indicator of what we should try to achieve, we have a gap between the measurement and what we're really trying to do, and we no longer have the power. I mean, even if you have faith in the expert power to, as it were, make the, make the necessary modifications, uh, they have increasingly given up the, the, the ability to make those modifications. That is to say, we pay somebody, we say we want uh, you know, a bridge with, just, with these characteristics, or we say we want an educational system in which uh, our students score higher on the standard tests than, uh, than other students. 
do, and there are various things that, uh, a, that a contractor might do in order to try to fulfill, as it were, the measure which might or might not produce the thing you wanted uh, when, you, when, when you commissioned it. So there is a space the, the, between the indicator and the thing you're really interested in, and within that space, many fascinating things happen in our, in, in our modern world. So I like to call this a space of exploitable ambiguity with its uh, acronym, SEA, indicating how wide it is uh, when, um, when uh, un under the right circumstances. Now, so, so, so now we think of, of uh, situations like you know, Pisa, which is, uh, yeah, so I showed you Pisa once already, and now I show you Pisa again, but this now is actually this program for, uh, what, what is it, um, for um, educational measurement and assessment. Um, and, but it is one of many kinds of, uh, of uh, indicators of, uh, of fulfillment of goals, which perhaps doesn't measure exactly what we want. So the real issue is, again, we have uh, um, numbers, you know, that is the human science is engaged in remaking the world, but, uh, but perhaps the space between the indicator and the thing we're after uh, uh, means that the uh, world we make is not the world we aim for, uh, that we end up making. And actually, it's not just that, the problem is not simply that there is a little, there's a, there's a little difference between what is indicated and what the, what the indicator gives us and what we want. The problem is the, all the activity that takes place in that space, which actually can widen that gap immensely and turn the, the bridge, you know, the, the famous, I don't know, one famous example for the US is the subway straps which are in, on the New York subways, which are supposed to have had, you know, hundreds of pages of descriptions, exactly what they should be. And yet still the subway strap makers find a way to, to make a subway strap that meets all those requirements and still doesn't actually do the job. Uh, and, that I can, and then there's a whole dynamic of, of bidding, of, re, of re re, renegotiating the contracts that, that sets in motion. And so in some way, it often is easier to act on the indicators, that is to say, to do something for the sake of the measures, which, uh, which doesn't actually fulfill the purpose uh, that was intended. So um, again, the problem is not simply the imperfect accuracy, but the opportunity for manipulation that this space between indicator and the thing itself uh, 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 makes possible, and so that's uh, you know. I hope this isn't uh, doesn't uh, appear to be a, um, um, a you know a uh, uh, an argument in opposition to numbers, which are you know in va very valuable to think with and which uh, allow us to understand many things that we don't otherwise understand. But to suppose that in some way um, the capacity of uh, the experts. Uh, that like this guy at Lies, who thinks that we can use the numbers to kind of give a general sense of things and then we can work around it, that actually the numbers have strengthened their own dynamic or the dynamic of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of altering and manipulating numbers has um, made it um, more difficult to, uh, to maintain, um, that is to say, to maintain the definition of the thing you really wanted as opposed to the measure uh, that is supposed to approximate it. So, and with that, I just finish with, their, uh, with, our, with this bird again, and thank you very much for, for, for listening.